So this is the second Artist Network Symposium, and most of you are more familiar with each other probably than you are with me, and many of you are probably more familiar with Josette than you are with me. Um, and yet, in so many ways, you know, we are family by virtue of the work that we do together. We've lost the mic. Hello, and it's back. Um, we're family, and we're making family, and we're making community together. And so today we're going to do, we're going to learn together. I'm going to learn, you're going to learn, and we're going to share. So as the new director of art and civic engagement, I wanted to speak just for a moment about what is it that I'm passionate about. Unlike many of you, I did not come up through Burning Man by attending the event. I came up around Burning Man by hosting artists who were building work when I ran Theater Arto or by um, partnering with Burner Artists when we launched Zero One San Jose, the Festival of Art and Technology in San Jose, or by surfacing Burners when I did a big old projection mapping in New Orleans and all the Burners in town came out and said, hey, what if we did something where instead of you showing us what could be done, we all did it together. So the Burner community has been very much a lively part of my world. And to be invited in now as a participant in the event itself is really a remarkable honor. And I think part of the reason I was invited is because I did have this experience out in the world. I um, grew up in the Bay Area, but I've lived in Philadelphia, Washington, DC, Los Angeles, and New Orleans. And I've also spent a fair amount of time in the contemporary circus community um, and the creative economies of communities internationally. And for me, where I'm living and breathing a certain kind of passion is I think the very, very close to the work that Gray Area um, Foundation is doing. And so this setup this morning is to speak a little bit about the intersection between the work of Burning Man and what the Art and Civic Engagement Department is all about and the work of Gray Area Foundation, which Josette will share more specifically about using um, a slide deck presentation. So she was not warned that I wanted to have a conversation with her. So, and we don't want to put her in the position of having a conversation with me where she says all the juicy stuff she was planning to say in her presentation. So at this point, she gets to say stuff if she wants to, or maybe she's just keeping me company till she gives us our, her presentation, <laughs> whichever feels most comfortable. So in 2010, I was working for the Nonprofit Finance Fund in Philadelphia, and my, the vice president of the Nonprofit Finance Fund said to me, I need you in the Washington, D.C. office. And I was like, great, I'll go to the D.C. office. And when? He said, three weeks, and no relocation money, but your job depends on it. <laughs> and it was July, and it was 100 degrees and 100% humidity in Washington, D.C., and while I had thought about these things about space before, because back in the early 90s, I was very influenced by a guy named Bill Strickland who um, began the Manchester Craftsman's Guild in Pittsburgh. And he started with running power from a church to a vacant house and teaching ceramics to kids. And he started talking a lot about how, what the environment was like and how it influenced how the kids felt about themselves. If you put kids in environments that are beautiful, it tells them that they are worthy in a way that words cannot. So I had long been sensitized to this idea of what physical space can say to you. But it was when I was in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 2010 in July, and the light was blinding off of the sidewalks and the sides of the buildings. And the haves and the have-nots, the sort of uh, elite class and the working class, were so clearly demarcated. And you could see people who were taking the bus out an hour to the outer edges of Silver Spring, you know, and standing at bus stops that had no shade, you know, canopy, that there was no tree canopy, no shade structures. You could go into the grocery store and there was all the sounds of the beep and the beep and the alarm and the alarm and the rah, rah, rah. And it was like this cacophony of sound and blinding light and heat and the physical environment was in no way designed for the most part to support the humans. And I really started to think about that and to think about what is public space and who is the public in public space and how do we hold that space together? How do we have the rights around that? And in New Orleans, I dug much more deeply into that because it's a city still rebuilding itself with 30,000 blighted 
properties um, with youth that are deeply, deeply traumatized by the violence in the community and 52% unemployment for African-American males in New Orleans. I mean, it's just a really incredible place to, to explore these things and where the idea of putting out a sculpture or putting out a, even a mural can be very difficult if you need these bike racks and park benches and you know tree canopy. And so the ideas of kind of tactical, temporary, urban interventions that support community was something that I was really able to explore in New Orleans. And I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say a whole lot more. I, what I wanna speak to then is this kind of emergence and convergence of Burning Man. So there's Burning Man, the event, which in all reality means something different probably to every single person who participates in it. So it can be described in many different ways and some of the ways in which I might tell that story may or may not fit with how you think about it. But one way to think about the, the event in the desert is as a municipality, as a temporary municipality, as a place where people come together and make art together, both in advance of the event in collectives and communities and during the event, as a place where the creative citizen is expressing themselves through costume and dance and movement and love, as a place where in temporary terms we can explore what might be possible in other kinds of contexts. So part of the job of the Art and Civic Engagement Department is not just to get the art to the playa or to distribute honoraria or to try to be more elegant in the ways in which we serve artists, which we very much want to do. It's also how do we take the processes or the artworks or the practices of the playa and translate them into the world and support those people in the regional context and special events and in other ways in which those things are happening or to be invited in to different kinds of municipalities to share and to exchange, not to impose necessarily something that Crimson is very, very conscious of, but to exchange with each other those things that we have learned and those things that people are yearning or longing for. So this kind of way in which Burning Man has sort of slingshot its way into the forefront of what it is that the world is asking for now which is how we live together in public spaces, how we own those spaces together, how we don't just think about the economic value, which in the last, since 2000, when Richard Florida's The Creative um, Class book came out and Charles Landry's book about creative cities came out, sort of 99, 2000, cities jumped on to this idea of creative economy, which has now become creative placemaking as an economic theory, right, as a way to advance economics. But what about the theories that are about use value, about the utility or the use value, which is another economic term for the citizens who live there to actually derive greater benefit from the way in which the built environment holds them? I'd like to say that our cities are sort of a reflection of how we esteem ourselves and each other and that they didn't just grow up like trees. Those th they're built, the built environment, it's a social construction. Energy needs form to flow through. What we're manifesting in terms of our humanity is influenced by our public spaces. So before I invite Josette to remark on what I had to say or to just do her thing the way she had planned to do it, I wanted to share with you, there's a book that I'm reading called Build the City that was put out by the European Cultural Foundation. And I can give you the website. The uh, European Cultural Foundation has most of the essays that are in this book posted online. But in their introduction to this book, it's really interesting to me because what they're talking about here has a lot to do with the idea of the commons. But we say it says, we believe in culture as an innovative terrain for new forms of dem democratic, institutional, social, political, and existential experimentations and believe it is important to underline and further explore its central role in ongoing struggles over the commons against the backdrop of an ever-changing city landscape. Build the City, this book, is about people coming together through culture to reclaim their cities and take control of the decisions that affect their surroundings, their neighborhoods, and their lives. And what I can tell you is many of the essays and much of the thinking and many of the kinds of questions that people are asking in communities, not just in the United States but worldwide, are these questions of how we own and hold community together. And 
you know, this is the thing that the Burning Man community knows and understands, both intuitively and practically. We have this incredible community of knowledge and culture bearers who have something to give in the world. And really the job of my entire department is to help hold and to translate that and to partner with others. And I feel like in the little bit of time that I've spent with Josette, which was one brilliant afternoon for about an hour, where everything that was coming out of her mouth was like genius. I was like, genius, she's genius, she's genius. It's amazing. And so for me, you're the personification, both you and the work that you do, of the sort of optimizing of some of these ideas of how temporary interventions can create lasting change, how working with cities and thinking about art in public space can change the experience of living in a city, and how tools and resources created for artists can actually stimulate innovation and change that lasts and ripples far beyond the instigation of any one piece of art. And I wonder if you would like to either speak to some of what I've said or simply um, let me thank you for keeping me company and go ahead and give the presentation that you had in mind. Sure, um, so I just wanted to say welcome to the Grand Theater, first of all. <laughs> thank you guys for being here. And second of all, I, I think it's incredible to just talk about permission and intention um, in the city context and, and the, to deploy any, any project you need permit and you need permission. And I think it's incredible that Burning Man is setting the intention and giving permission to artists to think about in advance of taking out art to the playa to think about it coming back and affecting their cities. And I think that's a really big shift and I just wanted to, to say that as, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm very, very, honored to be part of this conversation because I think it's really important to set that intention. So I hope that throughout this day, we can start to embed a lot of that thinking and spread that out into the Burning Man community. Um, so thank you for setting that intention. <laughs> How many people have been here before? Oh my goodness. Five? Okay. So this is what it looked like before. Um, it was a dollar store. I just want to set context for the building briefly. Um, th it was a dollar store built in, it, it was a do this was a grand theater built in 1940. Um, it, from 1995 until about two th 2014, it was a, a dollar store. So it actually looked like a Kmart in here. Um, and there were rows and rows of, of 99 cent products. Um, we, <laughs> we just finished renovation, actually, and we got our liquor permit. We have every permit that you could ever want as an arts organization, which is a huge deal. We have a liquor permit. We have, um, we'll talk a lot about permits. We have um, the, the planning department here, and I think it's really, really important um, to understand how these processes work, because if you can't get the permit, you can't do the art and you can't do the project. Um, so we run an, uh, an arts incubator, we do performance events, we have a creative coding education program where we teach art and electronics to create interactive art. Um, we do laser projection shows and immersive media. Gray Area's um, mission is to apply art and technology for positive social impact. And we do that through civic engagement and that's what I'm gonna talk to you about now. Um, and I want to uh, set some context. I want you guys to, th I'm going to go through a little exercise. I want you guys to think about um, your commute to work, your commute to play, your commute in general through the city, and what goes through your mind when you are commuting to work. Um, and so, do you think this? I wish the bus was on time. This is, if you woke up early, you skipped your coffee to get to the bus, the bus is not there yet, you're trying to make it, so you order an Uber or a sidecar, which is, is starting to resolve this, this issue. Or I wish there were more bike lanes. I, I personally have been hit by a car. If there was a bike lane where I was, I would have um, probably not get hit by the car. I wish the sidewalk conditions were better. I snapped this photo in Mexico City after I had like twisted my ankle walking down the street or you need, you want a place to sit. This is a, this is a risk, the city's response in China to the homeless problem. Um, they put spikes under the, the freeway so that you wouldn't, the homeless people wouldn't sleep there. Would this be the same response you might have uh, to the homeless issue? Or I wish there were somewhere to use a restroom. <laughs> uh, this is a, during beta breakers, 
it's a mushroom peeing on a, on a neighbor's property, and then you've got the neighbor trying to take the law into his own hands. Um, so, so I want you to think about these issues and, and what would happen if you transformed your civic frustration into creative action. Um, so this is the, the sort of underlying question that Gray Area has been asking ourselves um, and our community. Uh, how, do you, how do you take these issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in every city that we live in and try to apply them to tactical urbanism, urban interventions. This is a project called Pea Planter. It was created during the Urban Prototyping Festival in 2012. It's a biodegradable urinal. So you can actually pee in the planter and then it becomes nutrients for the plants. This was created by Haife Design Lab. They created the planter boxes on the facade and they also created the, the big living wall at the new SF MoMA. Um, so this is a, a direct response to the public urination issue in San Francisco. Um, the, if you walked into the, into the Tenderloin, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, this is another project by George Zisidias. This is a, a, something that would replace a parking meter. So you could take a parking meter off, place this Pulsivicity project onto it. It has a heart rate monitor and starts playing music based on your, your energy level. So if you have frenetic energy, your heart's racing fast, you sort of have this like kind of crazy electronic song happening. If you're really mellow, you'll have more of an ambient tone. And so this starts to, starts to help people think about um, and how to connect to themselves while they're walking through the city. This was um, created at the Urban Prototyping Festival, then deployed into Boston into five sites. Um, for about two years, a couple years ago. So Gray Area invented this, this program called the Urban Prototyping Festival, and we did this because we were frustrated with the Tenderloin and, and the, the conditions of the street. If you wanted to make any of these projects, you can actually Google Instructables and go to Urban Prototyping. You can create a pea planter of your own. You can create a pulse of a city. So all of these projects are open source. There's 12 other ones. The city actually took this on as a, a, a project with the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. And so now it's the Market Street Prototyping Festival. It goes down two miles of Market Street. Um, ha it happened in April of last year. It will happen again in October. And Gray Area is actually taking 10 of those prototypes. And next week, um, 10 of the prototypes from this festival will be being built in the theater. And they will be out on Market Street for two years. So they'll be deployed out. Um, for so we're taking prototypes into semi-permanent installation. And so we, Gray Area was um, at the same time sort of Burning Man was in the Tenderloin. Gray Area was in the Tenderloin. This is a, a picture of me um, in front of uh, our old marquee. We were in a, a porn theater. So art theaters was a euphemism for a porn theater, like an art film um, from the 1920s. And so we renovated, this is not our first theater that we've renovated. We actually renovated a, a porn theater in the Tenderloin at 55 Taylor, which is now the Center for New Music. Um, so this, well, so this is obviously what Market Street used to look like. It was fantastic, people everywhere, uh, theaters open. And so when we moved in, obviously it's like, I, this is a, a picture I sh snapped on New Year's Eve in 2011 and I saw the first murder of, of 2011 um, out right in front of our doors. And so we were running this sort of arts organization where like how do we change the energy of the street what can we do? We started to, to put projects, interactive projects into our windows. And we started to see sort of the connections that were being made between communities, as Kim said. You start to see, um, you know, the, the sort of disadvantaged uh, homeless people and then the people that were coming to the theater or the start to talk. And this becomes a sort of connection point, a community center um, out in the street. And so, especially with interactive art, you start to, s to spark dialogue with people. This is a, a project by Camille Utterback. And so she took um, shots of, uh, she took movies around the Tenderloin and then basically when you walked backwards and forwards in front of the piece, it would rewind and fast forward. That's me cleaning <laughs> windows, <laughs> as I often do. I'm also the janitor here. Um, this is a, another project we did during uh, Lights on Market with um, Burning Man was actually involved in the Arts Commission. So this was um, a piece by Theo Watson. Maybe some of you guys saw this here. It was in our, our facade window. So you'd walk up to it. Um, 
take a picture, and then it, you become a billboard across the street. And so this was really fantastic because it created an archive of, of, um, of faces of the community. So there's like thousands of faces stored um, on a hard drive of all the different types of people that, it, that live and, and work and, and commute through Market Street. Um, and it became like this incredible space. Like you, you would start like all the, 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 the people that are usually like selling drugs or dealing drugs or whatever, they became sort of docents for the piece, which was really incredible. So they were just like, this is how you do it. And this is like, the, you know, you just walk up here and check this out and making all the, you know, so they, so then there's like 500 of these <laughs> in the faces of, of those people, the docents. Uh, so this is, d d I just wanted to highlight this project because it's just such, art can do so much for connection and, and for community in public space. And I, I also wanted to highlight the fact that um, th the city does re realize that there is this creative resource, specifically in San Francisco, we have such an amazing um, uh, group of people from the tech industry, the arts community, to design, and th the city sort of takes um, inspiration from a lot of work that we do. And so Matthew Passmore, who will speak later, um, through his, his work at Rebar, um, d designed the, the parklet, um, it, the parking day. Do you guys know what these are? So, so this was the first one in 2005. Um, it's scaled, it's scaled all around the world. And I, I just love showing this because I think I found the first parking day. So in 1935, these were the first um, um, parko meters, and everyone hated them in Oklahoma City. <laughs> so <laughs> newfangled nuisances. Um, so there are 140,000. So this is like, oh, wait for it, wait for it. So this is the first parking day, I think. Um, so these are these people are protesting the the newfangled contraptions, and they've started to feed uh, <laughs> parking meters and are sort of protesting. And then the the police officer has no idea what to do because they've found a loophole, right? So I think that it's <laughs> it's up to artists to find these loopholes and to find these these sort of gray areas. And th this is 1935. I think that's the first parking day. Uh <laughs> so th there's. Obviously, no better prototype of what a city would look like um, if the keys were handed over to creatives than the annual Burning Man Festival. And so, did you know that like the same Wi-Fi network? So this is me trying to put Wi-Fi out there in, in the CC, asking my neighbor, "Can I please use your scaffolding? I've got to submit a grant. I know I I won the grant, so I know you're not supposed to work at Burning Man, but I needed Wi-Fi. So I set it up. We got the line of sight, and it's the same infrastructure that's used in San Francisco. So there's the same community mesh network running between nonprofits that Burning Man uses. So Rolf Mullen runs that network, and he sort of like runs on the war field. So it's, it, these, these, these projects, the city infrastructure is actually being prototyped uh, at Burning Man quite a bit. And there's these city blocks, there's this infrastructure, and I just wanted to, to, to highlight the fact that this is, it's such an important thing. Um, these, these also become like community centers, right? So they become attraction points. These sculptures are like public squares. This is a project that we did, we collaborated on with Ardent. This is a great, it has audio, but did you guys see this? Yeah. So imagine if this project was built knowing what ADA compliance is, knowing what could be deployed into the city. Um, this is sort of what I'm hoping we can start to think about. I'm hoping that we can start to think about developing a toolkit that's given to the artists going out to apply it to understand restrictions in cities, um, to understand the restrictions in San Francisco so that these artworks can, don't have to fully be redesigned um, out to come back out because now the, you know, all of these can't be burned. This is all metal, so these are stored. And so what do we do with these projects after, after the playa? So I'm just gonna close um, with a quote by Jane Jacobs. Cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everyone. Thank you so much.